Well, happy Sunday morning to everybody. I hope that you are doing well. It's so nice to be able to get back and do a little bit of recording. Um, this morning, I'm going to be in Mark chapter 6, if you want to kind of join me there. You know, uh, over the past week, of course, I spent a few days in the hospital, and there's not a whole lot to do there uh, when you're in isolation, but I did get to watch some old movies from my childhood, and one of them was uh, The Karate Kid. And Of course, most of you, if not all, have probably seen the movie, and uh, Daniel wants to learn from Mr. Miyagi how to uh, defend himself and take karate. And so Mr. Miyagi begins to train him, but he does it in kind of a unconventional way, we'll say. Uh, and it frustrates Daniel because Daniel doesn't feel like he's getting trained in karate. He feels like he's just doing Mr. Miyagi's home projects, you know, the whole wax on, wax on, and up and down and all of that stuff. But what Daniel didn't realize in the moment was that Mr. Miyagi actually was training him. And it's not really till the very end that uh, Daniel finally gets that. And so it kind of got me thinking about, you know, my situation and really a lot of people's situations um, here. We don't always see what God is doing. And the fact of the matter, I'd, I'd say this, that there are some things that we can only learn as God sends us through a storm. And so uh, this morning, I'm actually entitling the message, Into the Storm. But before I read that, I do want to take a moment and, of course, say thank you for your prayers, uh, the text, the emails, the encouragements. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're praying for several specific things uh, today. First, uh, we didn't get the chance uh, last Sunday to be able to pray uh, for our teachers and our students as they went back to school uh, this past week. And so we want to be able to do that. Uh, but we also want to pray about two specific things. There was uh, yet another earthquake there in Haiti. And so um, there are already North American Mission Board uh, people on the ground there and missionaries. Uh, all the reports seem to say that everybody's okay, but there's a lot of devastation. So we want to pray for that. Um, but of course, the, the real pressing need is over in Afghanistan right now. Um, as the Taliban has been sending letters to uh, Christians and church plants uh, there in Afghanistan say, we know what you're doing, we know where you live, and we're coming for you. So um, we want to make sure that we are remembering our brothers and sisters around the world uh, that are worshiping today in a very different context that you and I are. So before we get into our Bible study, would you join me in prayer? Uh, Father, we count it a joy that on this Lord's Day we can come before you and we can worship. And Father, we live in a nation in which we can worship freely. And even when we can't get together in person, uh, Father, we have the uh, ability to be able to meet digitally without fear of reprisal or uh, persecution. And so, Lord God, help us not to take that for granted, uh, but rather to utilize it for your glory, that your kingdom would be expanded through the proclaiming of the gospel and through the building up of your church. Father, as we come before you, we want to pray uh, for all those that are battling COVID and cancer and various other things. Uh, God, there's so much uh, suffering in the world at this time. and But Lord, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for it. We know that you're controlling every bit of it. And so God, we just pray for the doctors. We pray for the nurses on the front lines. Uh, Lord, protect them. Give them strength and energy as they uh, not only take care and treat the patients, but in many instances, they're the only real face-to-face -face contact a patient has uh, while in the hospital. And so, uh, God, we want to pray for for our first responders and uh, for our doctors and nurses as they continue to do just a phenomenal job uh, in this fight. And Father, we also want to uh, pray for uh, 
those in Haiti who are uh, digging out from yet another earthquake. And Father, we thank you that the loss of life reports so far have uh, been minimal. We know that they're that they're going to go up. And God, we mourn the loss of each and every life. And uh, we pray for the families that it is affecting. We pray, God, for the missionaries and the disaster relief workers that are on the ground or uh, even those that are going to be traveling there. Uh, Father, help them not only to go on a mission of mercy, but even more so a mission from you that is uh, directed and devoted to the gospel. We know that it's through suffering that often uh, people hear the gospel for the very first time. And so, God, we pray that out of this earthquake and uh, the suffering that is resulting, that, God, there will be people who are saved from it, that truly there could be a triumph in the midst of this tragedy. Lord God, we want to pray for our brothers and our sisters in Afghanistan right now as they are living up under a very real threat at this time. Uh, we know that uh, there is spiritual warfare all around us, and they have to deal with it on a daily basis as simply being a Christian could cost them their freedom or their life. And yet they have judged that you are more worthy than suffering and persecution and their life. And Father, we thank you for their testimony. We pray, God, that it would strengthen us uh, here in America to be serious in our faith uh, while we get to enjoy relative freedom. God, we know that many church planters are um, facing persecution right now. And Lord, <clears throat> while we pray that you would remove that persecution. Uh, we know that you have a plan for it. And so, Lord God, we want to simply ask that you would help them to be faithful in the midst of the difficulties that they are facing now and that they will be um, in these coming days and weeks and months ahead. Lord, I just, uh, we pray that your church would continue to expand in the Middle East uh, and indeed around the world, that men and women would take the Great Commission seriously, motivated by the great commandment to love you and to love others, and that wherever we would go, the name of Jesus and the gospel would be on our lips, that many people might come to hear it, that through your grace you would convict, draw, and save them. Father, not only do we pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, but in other parts of the world, uh, many countries, it's illegal to have a Bible, to be a Christian, to go to church. And yet these men and women, they continue to do so. Father, would you strengthen them, encourage them, help them to know that they are not alone, that you are with them, that they have other brothers and sisters around the world lifting them up this morning in prayer, praising you for them and coming alongside, suffering with them, even if at a distance. And Lord God, this past week has seen the children of Franklin County and other localities return to school for the 2021-22 year. God, we thank you for the safety of the buses and the children in school so far. Father, we lift up each and every one of the teachers, the principals, the administrators. We pray for the school board that you would give wisdom, Lord, in all that they do. We pray, God, that uh, especially for those men and women who are teaching in the county who are disciples of Jesus, we know that they're in a difficult spot because they have to teach according to the curriculum, um, even in those times when it goes against their sincere uh, beliefs. But Father, let them to be a light. Help them to be salt to their students. While they may not be able to overly uh, evangelize, God, their light and their life can certainly point these students' hearts to them. Give them a love and a passion, not just to teach, but for these students, to help these students to see that they're not alone. 
especially that many are being raised um, outside of a, a natural nuclear family. God, and, and there's a lot of suffering within our county. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, protect our students this year. We pray, God, that uh, there would be no shootings and uh, other things that create so much anxiety. We pray that these students would grow intellectually, but more importantly, that there would be opportunities for them to grow spiritually. And Father, we just ask that we as a nation would fight for our children, fight for our families, fight for those who are the most vulnerable among us. Lord, where there is injustice, may the church call it out. May we fight and strive against it that your peace, that your strength, your justice might flow uh, across this nation and indeed across this world. And Father, as we open your word for a few moments, Father, I pray that your spirit would be the one to speak. I pray that you would give me clarity of thought. I pray that you would give me uh, strength of my voice and my body to be able to do this. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, I'm in Matt, Mark, excuse me, chapter 6. And I'll apologize now for having to stop somewhat frequently to get something to drink. Uh, <clears throat> but hopefully we're going to be able to make it through it again. Uh, the message is entitled, Into the Storm. Uh, let me set the scene here. Jesus has been doing uh, his ministry. He has sent out the 12. Uh, they've come back and given an incredible report. John the Baptist has been beheaded. And really, uh, that sets up the time where Jesus uh, kind of withdraws a little bit. Uh, yet a crowd follows him and he feeds the 5,000 men, probably a crowd of 10, 15,000 when you consider the women and children and with just uh, two fish and five loaves of bread. And so at the very end of that, uh, we see Jesus do something that honestly kind of seems strange. Let me pick it up in verse 45. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So this is a familiar story for you and I. And so I just wanted to, to pull out a few things that stood out to me as I was actually reminded of this text um, uh, while I was in the hospital uh, as I had read uh, a couple different devotionals. But you know, one of the first things that I think we see is this. Jesus sent the disciples into this storm. You know, when Jesus dismissed them and told them to get in the boat, go to the other side, and even though he went up on the mountain to pray, he knew what was coming. Now, sometimes we might ask, why would God send us into a storm? And maybe it's not a physical storm. Maybe it's a, a mental or emotional or, uh, you know, right now in my case, a, a physical storm, uh, having battled COVID-19 pneumonia and things well, sometimes God sends us into the storm because he wants to reveal who he is to us. Remember, there are some things that we just can't learn in the midst of peace and prosperity. The greatest lessons that we learn oftentimes come from the greatest adversity that we face. And so, you know, in revealing himself, God is showing that he is sovereign you know, Jesus went up to pray, even though he knew what was coming. He was never in a hurry because he knew what he was going to do. He knew that this storm had come 
for a purpose. And that purpose was so that his disciples would know who he is, that they would learn to trust him more. You know, verse 51, uh, it says, And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. You know, it reminds me of this, that Jesus was in control of the storm. The disciples, they weren't in control. And, and man, they were painfully aware of it. They were frightened. I mean, here are experienced fishermen caught in a storm that they can't get through. And all of a sudden, here comes what they perceive to be a ghost walking at them. I, I can understand that fear, right? Um, I, I remember the night that Diana took me to the hospital. Uh, the biggest reason she took me to the hospital is I couldn't get a deep breath. Uh, and in that moment, I knew I could breathe, but I couldn't breathe the way that I was used to. I wasn't breathing the way I, I wanted to. And so p fear and panic kind of set in. Of course, uh, we know that when that happens, it can make the situation even worse. But that's why we have to remember again that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that yeah, Jesus was in control of this storm because it was going to accomplish his purpose. The third thing that I, I see in the text is that despite all of the disciples' efforts to control their situation and to save themselves, it was futile. I mean, there in verse 47, when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he, when he saw they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. Everything the disciples knew to do as experienced fishermen, it wasn't succeeding. It wasn't getting them through the storm. Everything they tried, just it, it was, it just was futile. They were making it painfully. Why? Because the wind was against them. And it's a reminder that there are forces around us that are against us. Now, the the wind in this case is actually the wind. Um, but we have to recognize that there's spiritual warfare all around us, that Satan wants to divide us. He wants to distract us. He wants to discourage us, which is why we have to remember that God is in control. Because if God's not in control, then we're left to circumstance and, and coincidence, and that's never going to be a good place. You know, the disciples needed a Savior bigger than themselves. They could have kept rowing and rowing. And, you know, the text makes mention that it's the fourth watch. And uh, the Romans divided the watch up into four, uh, the night into four watches. And the fourth watch would have been the very last one, about 3 to 6 a.m. So at some point, they had been rowing probably for hours and not able to make a very short trip, a, a trip that they had made probably hundreds of times in their life. But they needed a, a savior bigger than themselves. And this is really kind of the overarching theme. So do you and I. You and I often try to save ourselves by uh, being a good person, uh, doing good things, you know, going to church, being baptized, uh, tithing, serving, whatever it happens to be. And we're often tempted to think that if I can just do enough, then it'll be good enough. But just like these disciples, despite our greatest efforts, we will always come up woefully short of being able to save ourselves and all of our efforts will never control our circumstances or our situation. And so if I could apply this to us in just a couple of ways, I would say this. First, if you've never done so, you need to trust Jesus as your Savior. You know, the biggest threat to your life is not a storm outside of your life. The biggest threat to your life is the sin in your life. You know, our sin alienates us from God. We're born sinners by birth and by choice. 
And because of that, we are hopeless and we are helpless, alienated from God, spiritually dead. Meaning that if we die having never trusted in Christ, then eternal separation in a lake of fire is our reality. And again, there's nothing that you and I can do on our own to to remedy that situation. We can do all the religious things in the world, yet Isaiah 64, 6 reminds us that all of our righteousness is but filthy rags. It's nothing but a bloody cloth in God's sight. Now, how many of you would take a blood-soaked cloth and go wipe off your your mirror in the bathroom or or go wipe off your your car after you had washed and, and waxed it? I mean, none of us would do that. And yet, so often, so many people, they're trying to save themselves instead of understanding they need a Savior who is bigger than them, the sovereign God of glory, who left his glory in Colossians 1. I love Paul's picture there. He leaves his glory in heaven to come to a place to redeem us and to reconcile us. How? By the blood of the cross. It is only in faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ that you or I can be saved. But not only do you need to trust Jesus as Savior, you need to trust him as Lord. You know, Jesus, throughout this text, he shows us that he is in control. He shows us his power. Let me ask you, if if God could feed 5,000 men with just two fish and five loaves of bread, if he can walk on water, if at a word he can calm a storm, then tell me what's too hard in your life for God? See, there's nothing outside of his control. There's nothing outside of his power that God cannot use for his purpose. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what storm is raging in your life. I know Uh, Again, I've got one in mind. I know several in our church are going through them. Um, I've said it many times before. uh, You're either uh, going into a storm, you're in the storm, or you're just coming out of it. That's the reality of the the fallen world that we live in. But I want to encourage you right now to be prepared for storms to come by knowing where to turn. You know, the disciples, when they saw... Jesus, they cried out. And what does Jesus say? Do not be afraid. He was with them. And he said, I'm in control. I've got you guys. So just know that wherever you find yourself right now, God is with you. There is a plan and there is a purpose. My question to you as we close this morning is this. Will you run to him in prayer? Will you trust him? so that you can have the peace and rest that can only be found in the God who calls you into a storm, who walks with you in the storm, and by his power and grace will bring you through that storm. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these few minutes in your word. And God, I pray for each person who is watching this, that above all else, God, they have surrendered to you. Father, if they haven't, would they just reach out to me today, Pastor Justin at westlakebaptist.org. God, that I could share with them how they can begin to walk with you in a new life given by your grace, rooted in faith, that will not only change their eternity, but it will change their present circumstance as well. Father, I pray for all those who are going through storms right now. Lord God, would you comfort them and give them peace to remind them of your presence in their life in the midst of this storm. Remind them of your power over this storm and that you have a purpose for it. Father, let us give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for spending a few minutes. I hope it encourages you. If I can pray for you or help you, uh, there's two ways you can reach me, prayer and at westlakebaptist.org, or you can email me personally at pastorjustin at westlakebaptist.org. I love you. God bless you.